We will come to order now. First of all, I would like to say good morning to everybody. Today is May the 29th, 2022, Bible Study Guide number 13. Today's title, The Spiritual Fruit of Freedom. The background scripture comes from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26. The printed text is also Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 26. And this morning, our devotional reading will come from Isaiah chapter 32, verses 1 through 8. But at this time, I would like for everyone to join me in a verse of song. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. Why on others thou art calling? Do not pass me by. I'm calling you Savior, who Savior. Hear my humble cry. Why on others thou art calling? Do not pass me by. I'm calling you Savior, who Savior, hear my humble cry. Why on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Good morning. This morning we too from Isaiah chapter 32, verses 1 through 8. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and a princess shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of the water, and a dry place as shadow of a great rock and weary land. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hear again. The heart also of a rare shall understand knowledge. And the tongue of the stamina shall be as ready to speak plainly. The veiled person shall be no more called liberal, nor the churl said to be bountiful. For the veiled person will be will speak verily, and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy, and to utter error against the Lord to make empty the soul of the hungry, and the and he will cause the drink of the thirst to fail. The instrument also of the churl are evil, he divish devilishly wicked device to destroy the poor with lying words even when he they need to speak right but the liberal devilishly liberal liberal things and by liberal things shall be shall he stand i read to you from isaiah chapter 32 verses 1 through 8. thank you let us pray this morning, Father, we come to you with thanksgiving in our heart. We thank you, Father, for just waking us up this morning. We thank you, Father, for touching us with that finger of love. Thank you, Father, for our health and our strength. First of all, Father, we want to thank you for your darling son, Jesus, that died on the cross for all our sins. We thank you, Father, for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Father God, we want to ask a special prayer for the parents, family, and friends of the, the kids that was shot the other day in Texas. We pray that you just be with them this morning, Father, and touch them in a mighty way. We pray that you continue to support and bless the people of Ukraine. I pray that you just touch the people in Russia and put a little peace in their heart this morning. We pray for our sick and our shut-in. We pray for our bereaved family. Pray that you bless our services this morning from the Sunday school throughout the morning service. Bless the pastors. He brings the word. Bless everyone that's bowed with me in prayer. These best to be asked in your darling son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Let your life shine, shine, shine. Let your life shine, shine, shine. It may be someone lost in the valley trying to get home, trying to get home. Let your life shine, shine, shine. Let your life shine, shine, shine. It may be someone lost in the valley trying to get home, trying to get home. 
I would like to thank everyone for participating in our opening services this morning. And at this time, we will turn it over to Rev. Connor for our Sunday school lesson. Thank you, Dean. Good morning, everyone. Truly, indeed, another blessed day. Been in Lord's house once again, and here at Sunday school once again. And indeed, we have a wonderful, wonderful lesson in store today. Wonderful lesson in store, talking about the spiritual fruit of freedom. The spiritual fruit of freedom. And I'll, um, we'll be coming from Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 through 26. And our devotion reading this week came from Isaiah 32, 1 through 8. And our aim for change this morning tells us that we will explore the freedoms gained when walking by the Spirit, desire the personal and relational qualities of a Spirit-led life, and support one another in living a life centered on Jesus Christ. And so as I said, we have a wonderful, wonderful lesson in store. And as Deacon McKenzie had stated earlier, let us just continue to pray for those families in Texas that have lost the life of their children. For truly indeed, it is just a, a pure shame and just a disgrace to our United States and to the families how we can, you know, and, and I just have to be blunt, how politicians and those in government can simply just overlook these acts. Um, there are more things that we can do in society, and I don't mean to sidetrack on Sunday school lesson this morning, but I do have to say this, you know, as being a member of the military and then just growing up the way that I have, it is just a shame that we do not uh, be more proactive and take more steps to protect our children. It is just a shame that 10-year-olds and 8-year-olds and 9-year-olds have to lose their lives because an individual displayed um, violent tendencies weeks prior and all these signs were there, whether you want to say mental um, issues or what have you, all these signs were there and yet and still nothing was done. But a child can turn 18 years old in Texas and they can go out and buy an AR-15 weapon um, that our gun sellers sell and people know that these weapons are being sold but nothing is done to prevent them from buying these weapons. So what's more important? Is the, the, the green dollar more important than people's lives? Um, you know, and, and are your political gains more important than our children's lives? Something needs to be done. I know many of you probably viewing us live might not like what I'm saying this morning, but something needs to be done in our society. Because if you look at the, stack, the, the facts, the United States of America sells more weapons than any other country in the world. Just look at the facts. And that is a shame. We sell more weapons and we have more mass shootings in our schools and other areas than anybody else. So what's wrong with that picture? Something needs to be done. And so this morning, we're going to continue on. I'm going to leave that alone because some of y'all are probably mad at me that likes having your weapons. Um, but I'm not a deer hunter, so I'm just going to leave it at that. And if I did hunt deers, there's just certain weapons we don't need to go hunt deers. And so the spiritual fruit of freedom, the spiritual fruit of freedom. So we're talking about the spiritual fruit of freedom. Looking at Galatians 5, verse 16 through 26. And so our background tells us this morning that we do not know the power at work in people's lives until we see the fruit that power produces. And so in Scripture, fruit um, is works or deeds. It's a sign of God's power moving within a person. So sin produces fruit, which is works of the flesh. But the Holy Spirit also produces the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of believers. So Paul reflected that our righteousness being based on Christ's righteousness and received as a gift was the foundation of the Christian faith. So this marked the separation of Christianity from Judaism. So in Paul's letter to the Galatians, he consistently 
emphasizes the difference between being enslaved by the law and free in the Holy Spirit as a means to teach the true gospel and solidify the church's identity. So Paul challenged the believers of his day to learn what every believer today would do well to remember. The key to making progress in the realm of Christian freedom is to keep walking what? In the spirit. So Paul is very much aware of the Galatians' need for a power that the law could not give. So rules and regulations can command, but they cannot empower us to do what is commanded. Because we break rules all the time, now don't we? But rules and regulations serve as a guide or a roadmap, but they cannot motivate or enable one to follow the direction and guidance that they give. As I said, we break rules all the time, don't we? We ain't motivated to follow rules sometimes. I broke some rules this week. I wasn't motivated to follow them. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit, See, the Holy Spirit motivates us. It guides us. You know, it gives us a reason. And when we disappoint the, our Lord and Savior, you feel that. So if the Galatians were to live free from sin's power to control their lives, if they were to fulfill the law, it would be because what? They surrendered themselves to the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. So only those who have surrendered and who keep on surrendering themselves to complete control of the spirit are empowered to walk according to the spirit's orders. So walking by the spirit orders, you cannot fulfill the desires of the flesh. I think we stated last Sunday, you can't serve two masters. If you walk according to the spirit, it's hard for you to, to fulfill the desires of the flesh. If you're walking according to the Spirit. But if you ain't walking according to the Spirit, Sister Teresa, oh, you can do whatever the flesh tells you to do. But if you're trying to walk by the Spirit, Brother Paul, it's hard for you to do what the flesh wants you to do. So I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Can you discern the fruit of the Spirit in your own life? Can you discern the fruit of the Spirit? Now, y'all ain't got to answer that question, but I want you to think about it. Can you discern the fruit of the Spirit in your own life? And I don't want you to answer that yet because I want you to stay tuned just a little bit longer. Let's talk about works of the flesh. Keep that question in your mind. Let's talk about works of the flesh. Someone read, read Galatians 6, uh, 5, 16 through 21 for me. Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are con contrary to one to the other, so that ye cannot do things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law, nor the words of the flesh are manifest which are these <clears throat> adultery fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, barrenness, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, rebellion, and such like of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in the time, that this which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm. Dick, you just don't know how much you spoke in that. So let's break some of this down. How does one go about following the spirit, but not the law and not the world? How do you go about following the spirit, but not the law? And lastly, and not the world. So let's answer that question. Paul says the flesh lusted against the spirit. In other words, the two are diametrically opposed to one another. While yielding to the flesh is dangerous, a spirit-filled inspired life emancipates the believers from the law's requirements. 
This statement does not mean that the laws are to be disobeyed and overlooked, a notion likewise unsupported in the rest of the New Testament. However, it does contend that the law has lost its parental role because the law was like a parent in the life of, uh, uh, of, of the Christ followers. So the polarity stated in verses uh, 16 through 18 prepare the framework for the upcoming vice list within verse 19 through 21 and helps to distinguish them from the fruit of the Spirit. So this list is composed of vices that are anchored to self-centeredness and destroy life within the community. How many of y'all think I ain't even going to ask you to raise your hand. Just, just think about it. Because I know some of y'all here don't think that. Well, matter of fact, none of y'all here think that. How many of y'all think the Bible is outdated? The things in the Bible don't apply to us now. Has no bearing on our behavior now. Now, I dare say, I hope none of y'all don't think that. I don't think you do. But now let's look at this list, and y'all tell me if it rings true to you. The behaviors named here, each of them are grouped according to the semantic domains they emerge from. So when the, within the first clause, Paul argues that these manifestations of the flesh are its works, suggesting that they are actively producing outcomes. Let's look at the first group. Let's talk about sex, St. Paul. I know y'all want to talk about sex, don't you? Let's talk about a little sex. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, share the sense of lustful actions carried out with one's body. So while uncleanliness can mean in its ritual impurity, a woman uh, being unclean after her uh, menstrual cycle, uh, can't perform ritual duties at the, uh, at the sanctuary, uh, things of that nature that w were an issue back then. Paul use, usually uses the word in context of other sexual sins, though. Look at Romans 1, 24, 2 Corinthians 12, 21. Y'all can read it up. Colossians 3 and 5. Now, lasciviousness is also translated wantonness. Romans 13 and 13. Now, what's lasciviousness, uh, uh, Brother Paul? I mean, does the Bible apply to us today? If you're sitting around lusting after a woman, lusting after a man, got these thoughts in your mind of sexual acts or whatever you perform with them or that you do. I don't want to discuss y'all this morning, but this is the Bible. We're talking about sex. You got all these sexual thoughts going through your mind, lasciviousness. That's a sin. These are works of what? The flesh. See, our young folks think this stuff don't apply today. Oh, it applies. The Bible talked about this long ago. There's nothing new under the sun. We did it back in 1980, 1990, and guess what? Y'all rascals still doing it in 2022. It ain't nothing new. We just put a different name on it, but it's the same thing. So, Today, one might think that these actions are excusable since they take place, what, between two consenting adults or only in one's thoughts. You might think that's excusable. No, it's not. Because let me tell you something from a little experience that I've had. So, Sapargo, if you think it long enough, sooner or later, Deacon McKenzie, you're going to act on it. If I think about a woman long enough, when I was growing up, since far I thought about a girl long enough, guess what? I'm going to step up to her and say something sooner or later because I already had some preconceived thoughts in my mind. But she looked at me and she smiled at me a certain way and Deacon McKenzie, I'm thinking, oh, she must want me. <laughs> you had these thoughts going through your mind and then you act out on them. See, and, and that's why for us that are married, you need to thank God you married. Because, buddy, you got all you need right there every day. You ain't got to look at nothing else. But see, this younger generation, you think it's just, you just got this written check, you can just do what you want to do. So today, you might think that those actions are excusable. 
So make no mistake about it. These actions work much harm in the life of those who participate in them. So breaking promises also breaks hearts. Images and thoughts that we think are just in our own minds affect what? How we interact with other people. Now let's look at pornography. Me and the fellas, we snuck many days looking at Uncle VCR tapes. We did a whole lot of stuff down the street in the back room looking at these tapes, doing things. But guess what? Growing up, I soon realized as I got older, see, doing those things, it puts this image in your mind that this is how females are supposed to be or this is how you're supposed to have sex or what have you, and it's not. And then you go out as a young boy and you try to emulate what you saw on that videotape. And this girl is like, I know some of y'all probably like, ooh, why he talking about this stuff? But it happens. And then you go out and try to do it, and this girl be like, whoa, 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 what you doing? I don't do that. You know, and, and so it corrupts your mind and gets you in this tendency that, hey, this is how things are supposed to be. And it's not. But we don't only do that with pornography, we do that with other things. You know, kids can play video games today. Going back looking at what's going on now, Call of Duty. Kids can look at these games and then what? They go out and shoot up schools. It happens. This just be real. It happens. You know, they go out and do things. And then you, you trace it all the way back. They got mental disturbances, they got mental issues. And then they saw this, what, on a game. And because they saw it on a game, they thought, I can go out and do it. I used to play with G.I. Joe. But believe you me, you can't do everything that G.I. Joe does. I found that out, too. So there are some stunts that G.I. Joe did that I couldn't do. So a second subset, since I know I got you all un uncomfortable with talking about sex, but these are indeed sins of the flesh. So a second subset of these vices related to social structures emerges. Idolatry, the worship of false gods, witchcraft, sorcery, magical arts, hatred, holding someone as your personal enemy, hatred, exclusion, strife or contention, rivalry, rivalry emulations, what are we talking about rivalry there, emulations? What are we talking about? What is that word talking about? When you try to excel and be above somebody else, when, when you're causing that friction, I'm better than you are, you're causing that friction and wrath, passion, are sins committed by individuals in a community. So in a fierce way, they exacerbate divisions in society. We see all these things separating us in society. And so the third set, strife, partition, infighting, seditions, in, uh, divisions and heresies, dissensions, relates to the structural fabric of the community. The Apostle Paul uses these, this space to name the individual vices that are at work in, in his community to heighten the community's social injustices which is something no church wants to see. So St. Paul, I'm asking you real quick, do y'all see any of this stuff going on in our church, in our society, in our community? Do you see any of these things going on? What you say, Dick McGinnis? But some of us think the Bible is outdated. It don't apply. You know, some of these things the Bible talk about, well, that don't happen now. Ain't nothing new under the sun. So the final set of vices emerges from individual greed and covetousness, envying, talking about jealousy. And look at what it appears next to. It appears next to murders to communicate the impulse that has per perhaps motivated a host of evil behaviors up to and including murder. Drunkenness, 
A little sip won't hurt you. Intoxication. See, one little sip is one thing, but when you get intoxicated and drunk, well, that's a whole other story now, isn't it? And rivalries pretend a possible connection to the 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 uh, the Dionysian cult of the first century, which Bacchus, a similar deity, was worshipped by what throwing drinking parties. Drunkenness. We're going to worship our God. We're going to have a drunk party today. We're we just going to drink and get drunk. Some people might love if we did that at church. I know a few people that probably would that I associate with. They love if we had drunken parties, Sister Pargo, at church. Talking about we worshiping the Lord, getting drunk. So he wants to be crystal clear, crystal clear. They they form, firm cease and desist must be applied to all former pagan practices for those who now identify as what? Christians. Now I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Y'all viewing us live, you can raise your hand too. Do you identify as a Christian? I do. And guess what? All former pagan practices that we used to do, Paul firmly and crystal clearly says, you must cease and desist. You must stop doing that stuff. You got to stop doing it. Those who commit actions like these are following after what? The flesh and not the spirit, which guides all Christians, you are following after the flesh. Now, let me use myself for an example. I followed after the flesh this week. I try to stay cool. I try to stay calm. I try to keep my composure. But I lost my composure this week. I did, Sister Teresa. And when I lost my composure, I immediately felt convicted that I had messed up. Why? Because I try to follow after the Spirit. I said I try. I try to work on it every day. You know, because we're going to see here as we get on down into this lesson, there are times when you got to zip it. <laughs> you just need to, Sister Pargo, you can't say everything that's in your mind that you want to say. I ain't saying thoughts don't go through our mind, but sometimes those thoughts don't need to come out your mouth. Because when they come out your mouth, you can't take them words back. Because you done said it now. But see, when you're trying to live right and you're trying to do right, and them thoughts going through your mind, so far the Lord already telling you, you don't need to be thinking that. Because that old man is creeping up. And I ain't forgot some things that I used to do now. But then when those things come out your mouth, see, you done allowed the enemy to take over, and now you done spewed those words out. But see, you're trying to live right. You're trying to do right. And believe you me, the Lord will get you immediately and say, now, I told you, you shouldn't have been thinking that from the start, but now you done messed up and said it. And you're feeling all that coming down on you. Now, you got to repent first. You need to repent to yourself because you did let yourself down. You need to repent to the Lord. And then you need to repent to the person that you offended or that you said it to. And now you need to strive to do better and not do it again. Don't repeat it. But see, what happens is that we get into these notions that, well, the Lord know my heart. He understand. It was just a little bit. And then you repeat, you repeat, you repeat. Those who commit these actions, they are following after the flesh and not the spirit. So in order for us to follow after the spirit, Brother Paul, we have to continually, continually work on these things. You just can't do a little dab on Sunday, or do you? Because that little dab on Sunday ain't going to do you. You got you to gotta continually work at this thing. Because every day, Deacon McKenzie, different things come at us. That's going to try our patience. That's going to test our anger. 
that's going to make us want to say something every day. So if you ain't continually working at following after the Spirit, you will get yourself in trouble. We have to continually do these things. So let's move on. Let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we done looked at the works of the flesh. So now let's talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Someone read uh, 22 through 26 for me. Now, I like how Paul ended that. Now, we just got through talking about the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. And so now we're talking about what? The fruit of the Spirit. If I had a seed in my hand this morning, I wish I, I should have brought one. But I could have brought you a seed this morning, just any old seed. And I guarantee you, nobody in here would have known what kind of seed that was. You would not know what kind of seed that is until that seed started what? Growing. And start producing what it was intended to produce. An apple tree seed is going to produce what? An apple tree. Not a lemon tree. So contrasting the vi devices, Paul now shares the virtues that promote holiness and wholeness within the community of faith. The nine verses, uh, virtues listed here can be explained in triads, in three, in order that they appear. Now, that's what I love about this, in the order that they appear. So let's look at what's supposed to appear first. Love, joy, and peace. All function as virtues that are displayed within the individual. They grow internally like roots below the surface, deeply rooted in the life of, believer, of the believer. These are inner oriented virtues that foster a type of wholeness by showing concrete expression in the face of adversity. Love, joy, and peace. Now I want to stop right there a minute. Why y'all think love, joy, and peace is the first virtues that Paul listed? Why y'all think that? Those were the three that he first listed. Love, joy, and peace. God is love. Thank you, Sister Fargo. God is love. You sure enough going to get joy. And you sure enough going to have peace. Why do we get those three things? I, I just really got to looking at that. When we give our lives to Christ, don't you think love should be the first thing that we should see? That we experience love. And from that love, you got joy. And with that joy, you got peace. Now, I just love that because that's just telling me when I gave my life to Christ, I saw his love, I experienced joy, and I had peace because I was set free. You experienced all that right from the start. But from those three things right from the start, now what gets me is those three things right from the start, they're supposed to be rooted deep within you, and they grow internally like roots. That means you anchored down. And so now the second uh, group that comes along is long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. They represent a fruit of outward orientation. Now you got the inward, Sister Fargo, love, joy, and peace. Now you got the outward, which is long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. 
And so these virtues allow the Christian to hold up under what? Cruel pressure to act with calm respect toward others and generally display a wholesomeness acquired by the first three. So if you got the first three from the beginning, now you got an outward showing of long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. And that's why I failed this past week, because I lost a little something there. You got the seed that was planted when you gave your life to Christ. You had a seed that was planted in you. And when that seed started to germinate and grow, you got love, joy, and peace. And now with that seed blossoming within you, growing inside of you, what starts to show on the outside is what? Long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. It's an outward orientation. It's an outward showing. And so it causes us to hold, to hold up under cruel pressure. Do, say what, Sister Fargo? Holding on. Because look at it like this. How many people can tick you off in the course of a day? (laughs) Can make you upset? Can hurt you? Can cause you to make you want to go back and use some cuss words you ain't said (laughs) in a long, long time? Make you have some thoughts you ain't been thinking in a long time? See, things come at us daily. But see, when you got that growing within you, see, it's going to produce something on the outside. And, and what it's producing is, it's helping you to hold yourself together and maintain yourself <laughs> to keep that peace. But see, what Brother Connor did this week, Sister Pargo, I cracked a little bit and I let a little something out. <laughs> but then when I let it out, Look, it was like, oh, Jesus, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> you know, it was like, man, I shouldn't even went there. But see, what happened was, see, I can just speak for myself. I had this going on. I had a guard that died this week. I had other little stressors going on this week. I had a whole lot of different stuff going on. And I'm trying to maintain. And then this one little thing just pushed me on over the cliff. And I slipped up. And I had to gather myself back together. <laughs> I'm not saying that it's, it's uh, I'm, when you're in this flesh, things gonna come up. Yes, so they are. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. You ask for forgiveness. You can repent. But when you, it's gonna, it, you're gonna go through different things in life. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Things come up. Mm-hmm. But you've seen where you are, but you just didn't, just didn't, let it go. You took care of the matter. And, and see, the one thing that happens to the park, see, many people, they just let it ride. Because they think they just got a blank check. Well, I'm saved now. And you think, well, I just got a blank check. But see, as Paul tells us, those past, and we all got them, those past pagan behaviors we had, you got to cut that stuff off. You can't keep doing what you used to do. See, you got to change. You got to be a different person. And see, what happens is that love, that joy, that peace, see, it's growing within you. And so it's supposed to produce something on the outside. And what it produces on the outside is long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. They represent a fruit of outward orientation. And these things help keep us calm, you know, and respectful to others. And it generally displays a wholesomeness acquired by the first three. Now let's look at the final three. Faith, meekness, and temperance represents the fruit of self, (laughs) self mastery. Each one demonstrates the loyal responsibility of the Christian to act in accordance to the spirit of God. What benefit do these virtues add to the believer's life? 
to begin, faith represents the active attitude of believing and underscores the idea of God's trustworthiness. We say we believe him. We say we trust him. That's the benefit of it, faith. Now, meekness or gentleness produces great benefits for the believers in Jesus Christ, particularly in the realm of undeserved criticism. And also demonstrates itself in the, in the realm of anger as one who possesses meekness. See, this is why I slipped up, Sister Fargo. One who possesses meekness tends to rein in their anger, even in situations when it would be an appropriate response. The response might be appropriate, Sister Teresa, but you need to be a little meek. And you need to rein that in. Be because... You know, I admire my wife because this one thing about my wife, she can be mad as a hell dog, but boy, she can put a smile on her face. So pardon, she can say words to you so nice and so sweet, and she just be with a guillotine and, and a machete just dicing and chopping you up, and you just be feeling it too, boy. You be like, I know she ain't standing there smiling at me, saying these things to me, but she just be so calm. Look, it, it, look, she be loving hard too, Sister Fargo. And you be like, woman, stop cutting on me. She just be, shoo, shoo, shoo. and you just be standing there feeling it, boy. But then at the end, uh, you can't go back and say, well, you said to me like that, because she did it all in love. You can't say, well, you were looking all mad now, because she was smiling. You know, but look, she was being so meek. And what she really wanted to say, she was holding it in. But she would give it until you're so nice and so sweet. And then you got to sit there and take it all. And it's like, man, you got to come back. <laughs> I done had to do it too many times. And you got to come back. Baby, I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have said it. I shouldn't have did it. But see, that's how we're supposed to be. Meekness. Just because you want to say it. Just because it's an appropriate response for you to say it does not mean you need to say it. I should have reined it in. <laughs> see, and, and, and see, it's about self-control, temperance. It's a characteristic of those guided by the Spirit rather than impulsiveness, which is what I had, of the flesh. So you got to rein those things in. And you got to have temper. You got to have some self-control. And see, there are too many of us, as Paul, going in the house of the Lord. We ain't got no self-control. We just think we got a blank check. We can just do whatever we want to do. We can just say what we want to say. We can act how we want to act. And then we want to throw the banner of saved and sanctified on top of it. No. We can't do that. You got to cease and assist. You got to stop doing those things. And so you got to rein those things in. But see, like Sister Fargo said, yes, there are going to be times he can begin, we're going to slip. We're going to mess up. But you got to go back and get those things right. Clear that up. Start afresh. Look, because every day you got a fresh, you got a fresh portion of grace. So, so you got to look, hey, tomorrow, Later today, next five minutes, whatever, I can't do that again. And you got to get it right, you know. And so that is why we have to be continually guided by what? The spirit. So the possessor, now get this, the possessor of these virtues cannot be indicted. See, this is why people, this is why I want to boldly say this. If you walk according to the Spirit, don't let no devil in hell or your neighbor or your friend or your ace or your boon coon, whatever, they can't hold nothing over your head as long as you're striving to walk by the Spirit. Your past, what you did yesterday, what you did five minutes ago, as long as you're striving to walk by the Spirit, as long as you hold these virtues, you cannot be indicted. In other words, we cannot be at fault for having, look at this, joy. You can't be at fault for having joy. 
So though many may seek to rob you of your joy, you, you, can't, you can't be indicted for having joy. But if you were over here committing these sexual acts and these sexual behaviors and, and this drunkenness and all this stuff, you can be indicted. But for joy, you can't be indicted for having joy. You can't be arrested for having peace. Though sometimes being peaceful might cost us. No laws exist against forbearance, kindness, being gentle or faithful. And this is precisely the point Paul makes in the final clause. He's saying if you have these fruits, there are no laws against living them out. That is why Yes, there are things that the law, the law was like a parental guidance. It stated what you can't do. You know, it stated you can't do this, you can't do that. You don't need to do this, you don't need to do it. It stated all these things. But there was nothing on the inside guiding you, giving you that power to obey that. It was all your choice. But now when you, when, when you have the Holy Spirit and you're trying to live a spirit-led life, if you stick to walking according to the Spirit, it's hard for you to try to do things of the flesh. And you're trying to walk according to the Spirit. And even if you do mess up and do something of the flesh, the Spirit is going to pull you back and bring you back in. You need to get this thing right. You know, you have motivation to do right. See, I have a motivation to do right and live right. But before, I didn't have that. And I did whatever. But see, now you have motivation to do right. And see, that is the thing that our younger generation needs to understand. My kids, your kids, that's what they need to understand. See, living a life according to Christ, you have motivation, you have assurance, you have peace, you have joy, you have all that. But when you ain't trying to live right, you are open to whatever. And believe you me, anything and everything will come at you. Praise the Lord, Sister Parker. Praise the Lord, dear. Yeah. But see, Paul assures his audience, he assures us that following the Spirit, it will look much like obeying the law. But the freedom that Christ offers from the heavy weight of the law does not mean Christians would go around breaking those Jewish laws. Christ is the same God who gave those rules on Mount Sinai. So those being guided by his indwelling spirit will end up adhering, get this, to the moral guidelines of Judaism. However, the Christian will, will know that it is not their own efforts or animal sacrifices that make them follow these rules. It is the power of the spirit within that makes us follow these rules if you ain't got the spirit my young people my older people if you ain't got the spirit you ain't gonna follow the rules you ain't gonna have no moral value if you ain't got the spirit we can try to preach and teach morality all we want when we look at this society but if you ain't got christ and dwelling on the inside you ain't got no moral guidance that you're going to display on the outside. 
You got to have the spirit. And then you will morally follow the law. So no longer are they captive to their worst impulses or cravings. Paul says that the flesh has been nailed to the cross. This process is necessary for the cultivation of the fruit of the spirit to ensure the life, the new life that Christianity entails. You got to nail those sins to the cross. The conditional statement, if we live in the spirit, is contingent, get this, is contingent upon our constant yielding to his leading. You got to constantly yield to the leading of the spirit in order for you to live it out. So the spirit-filled life is not a complicated formula measured by legalistic to-do lists. It is a lifestyle informed by scripture and empowered by willing submission to the Holy Spirit's leading. Get this, a lifestyle informed, I mean you need to read your Bible, by the scripture and it is empowered by you submitting to the Holy Spirit to lead you. The ability to pursue a life pleasing to God is contingent upon complete abandoning of our lives prior, listen to me, prior to us getting converted, to us getting saved. You got to let it go. See, to live a life according to God's will, in order to, to, to live a life pleasing to God, you got to abandon what you used to do. You got to let it go. I don't care if you was a real OG back in the day. You got to let it go. You ain't the real OG no more. You just a servant now. <laughs> and we are all servants. It don't matter if I'm in the pool pit or if I'm in the pew. Guess what? Ain't no OGs up in God's house. We all servants. <laughs> Deke said it's time, <laughs> but Deke is so good. <laughs> okay, Deke, I'm finna finish up. <laughs> if, if one is skilled in, in, in yielding their life to the leading of the spirit, that person will also live a lifestyle that would reflects that reality. If you are skilled at yielding your life to the Spirit, your life going to reflect that. The entreaty of these final verses makes an appeal for the audience to avoid vainglory, glory without reason, provocation, irritating, and envying, bearing ill will or jealousy towards someone, so that neighborly love could continue unabated. It is easier to focus upon these vices when they are small and remove them as one would remove an invasive species of weeds to ensure that the fruit of the spirit will have the chance to thrive in the life of the individual. That's why parents it's so important that we be a part of our children's lives now so that we can remove some things while they small because when you want to wait till they get 21, it's a little too late. Because now, look, they, they set in their way. We are informed by the scripture and empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk in lockstep with him. This invitation will help us live the life Paul promises us in these verses and enable us to be fruitful in our efforts. Stephen McKenzie, he done tapped his watch on me. So I can't get into this one. How does the fruit of the Spirit unify us? Just look around in the church. How does the fruit of the Spirit unify us? Love one another. And my next question is this, quite the opposite. How do the works of the flesh undermine the Christian community? So if you look at how the fruits of the Spirit unify us, look at how the works of the flesh undermine the Christian community. See, you can't be in here talking about each other, running each other down, just like you do out there on the street. We got to be unified in the body of Christ. 
And I'm just going to leave it at that for the sake of time. <laughs> so as we close this morning, from the moment we're born, laws govern our lives. Babies got to have birth certificates. Children must go to school. You got to drive on green. You got to stop on red. Most people try to follow the law to the letter. So it's easy for us to look at the fruit of the Spirit as just more laws to follow. So the Lord desires that our lives reflect the fruit, but not the legalistic ways. Our lives should be an outpouring of our love for Christ and our desire to serve one another. That is what your lives should reflect, an outpouring of love for Christ and your desire to serve one another. And I'm going to leave it at that. And so next Sunday, we're going to look at God foretells destruction. Isaiah 47, printed text Isaiah 47, 10 through 15, and Psalms 137. And I aim for change where we will understand why God would destroy Babylon, grapple with the destructiveness of delight and power and pleasure, and repent, repent from thoughts, actions, and feelings that separate us from God. So I hope that you all were blessed this morning, um, that you gained something um, spiritually uplifting out of this lesson this morning. And so I pray that it will continually help you with your walk with Christ. And I'm going to stop talking now because Deacon McKenzie is up. He done got me. <laughs> God bless you all. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank Reverend Connor for that wonderful lesson. I pray that you take that lesson and apply it to your daily life. I know Sunday school can get good and just don't want to let it go, but that's what I always tell everybody. Anytime you get into the Word of God, it can do that to you. And sometimes you have to just let it lead you. But I did have to tap the time on him a little bit. I pray that you come today and join us for our 11 o'clock service live. You don't have to stay at home, but if you decide to stay at home, may God continue to bless each and every one of you and have a wonderful day.